15 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. And if you would like to teach Neil's story, what would you say if I could tell you there is a lesson plan for him that you can actually teach to your students, and not an old-fashioned one? You get a video guidance, a presentation and the printable worksheet. And guess what? Your students can actually chat with him. Amazing, right? Simply join Edflix and have access to the whole library. In the aftermath of the Second World War, humanity found itself at the brink of a new era, a tense Latin saga known as the Cold War. The United States and the Soviet Union, the two superpowers emerging from the ashes of conflict, embarked on a geopolitical chess match that would shape the course of history. The United States, guided by the principles of democracy and capitalism, found itself in stark contrast to the Soviet Union, a nation fueled by a communist ideology. The States was set for a class of political ideologies, economic systems, and ultimately a battle for global supremacy. The Cold War was not fought on traditional battlefields, but rather through a series of proxy conflicts, espionage and an arms race that kept the world in edge. The threat of mutually assured destruction loomed large, as both nations amassed nuclear arsenals capable of wiping out humanity. Yet, a new frontier emerged, one that would become the epitome of the Cold War, the space race. The quest for dominance extended beyond Earth's atmosphere, with both superpowers vying for supremacies in the cosmos. Space is open to us now, and our eagerness to share its meaning is not governed by the efforts of others. We go into space. Because whatever mankind must undertake, free men must fully share. I therefore ask the Congress, above and beyond the increases I have earlier requested for space activities, to provide the funds which are needed to meet the following national goals. First, I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. No single space project in this period will be more impressive to mankind or more important for the long-range exploration of space, and none will be so difficult or expensive to accomplish. We propose to accelerate the development of the appropriate lunar spacecraft. We propose to develop alternate liquid and solid fuel boosters, much larger than any now being developed, until certain which is superior. We propose additional funds for other engine development and for unmanned exploration, explorations which are particularly important for one purpose which this nation will never overlook, the survival of the man who first makes this daring flight. But in a very real sense, it will not be one man going to the moon. If we make this judgment affirmatively, it will be an entire nation, for all of us must work to put him there.
Neil Alden Armstrong was born on August 5, 1930, to Stephen and Viola Armstrong as the eldest of three children. Even as a boy, Neil showed an insatiable curiosity for the skies. His father, an auditor, fueled his passion by taking him to air shows and encouraging his interest in aviation. Neil was two, and his father and I lived in Cleveland, not far from the airport. Like many families during the Depression days of the early 30s, one of our inexpensive Sunday afternoon pastimes was airplane watching. Neil stood between us, his little face pressed so intently against the fence that it often left red marks. We were always ready to leave long before he was, and his plea was always the same. Can't we see just one more airplane? I was often uneasy about Neil's obvious fascination with planes, and I had to admit to myself that this child, our firstborn, was very special to me. After Stephen and I married, I was haunted by the fear that maybe I couldn't conceive. I had been an only child and often thought, what if I can't have even one baby? Then finally the day came when our doctor assured me I was pregnant. The minute I got home, I went down on my knees and thanked God for his blessing to us, and in the fullness of my heart, I dedicated this child to be to him. In the months that followed, I prayed steadily that this child would be given a thirst for knowledge and the capacity for learning which someday would accomplish noble deeds, hopefully to serve the work of the Lord. One Sunday morning when Neil was five or six, he and my husband left for Sunday school. When they returned, both had peculiar expressions on their faces. Stephen was a bit white-faced, but Neil was beaming from ear to ear. What is wrong with you two? I asked. There was utter silence. Suddenly a thought came to me. Did you go up in that airplane I read about in the paper? Now they looked relieved. Yes, that is exactly what they had done. A pilot was barnstorming in town, and Stephen said rates were cheaper in the morning. He had not really enjoyed the flight, but little Neil had loved every minute of it. One morning, Neil and I were walking down the cluttered aisles of a dime store looking for cereal bowls. My husband and I now had a wonderful family of three active children who consumed vast quantities of cereal. Somehow the bowls were always getting chipped or broken. I was selecting five shiny new ones when I felt a tug at my arm. Mom, will you buy this for me? Neil held up a gaily colored box. What is it? I asked cautiously. It's a model airplane kit. The eagerness in his voice betrayed his excitement. Mom, this way I could learn how to make airplanes. It's 20 cents. Quickly, I thought how 20 cents would buy two cereal bowls but how could I resist the urgency and enthusiasm in my son's voice? Honey, I said gently, could you find a kit for 10 cents? Sure, Mom. His face radiant, he raced back to the toy counter. Neil's journey continued at Pardew University, where he pursued a degree in aeronautical engineering. It was here that he honed his skills and embraced the challenges that lay ahead. He earned his pilot's license on his 16th birthday and became a naval air cadet the following year. After finishing college, Armstrong went to work for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, which later became the National Aeronautics and Space Administration in 1958. The mad-mannered kid from Ohio made his name as one of the most daring and skilled test pilots at NASA's Flight Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base in California. During seven years as a test pilot, Armstrong flew 200 different aircrafts that uh, pushed the limits of speed and altitude, including the legendary X-15 high over the California desert. Armstrong reached speeds of more than 4,000 miles per hour 
and took the needle nose next uh, 15 to the edge of space. Armstrong met Janet Elizabeth Sheeran, who was majoring in home economics, at a party hosted by Alpha C Omega. According to the couple, there were no real courtship and neither could remember the exact circumstances of their engagement. They were married on January 28, 1956, at the Congregational Church in Wilmette, Illinois. When he moved to Edwards Air Force Base, he lived in the Bachelor Quarters of the base while Janet lived in the Westwood District of Los Angeles. After one semester, they moved into a house in Antelope Valley near Edwards AFP. Janet did not finish her studies, a fact she regretted later in her life. The couple had three children. But amid the triumphs uh, that Armstrong was about to um, experience, a personal tragedy unfolded at that time. A tragedy that would shape the man behind the spaceship. I think Neil's most enjoyable time in his professional career was out in California. Actually, it all seems pretty idyllic for a while. He and Janet moved to this little cabin up in the mountains. And Ricky was born. Then Karen was born almost two years later. And she is just the cutest little girl. Neil's nickname for her is Muffy, which is a short for muffin. My husband, Jack, and I would go see them. Those were good times. But things get challenging when the little girl is diagnosed with a very malignant brain tumor at age two. They gave her radiation treatments, and she improved. But it didn't last too long. So they decided that they would try chemo. But the doctor said that she's such a tiny little girl. She could not afford chemo. Neil felt almost personally responsible He scoured the medical journals and talked to as many experts as he could, thinking that he could help. And he really couldn't. She died on the day of their wedding anniversary. For that reason, Neil and Janet never celebrated their wedding anniversary afterwards. It's extremely hard for both of them. But she was able to talk about it more. He just didn't go there. These are tapes with Janet Armstrong, a series of tapes. It's very hard to talk to Neil about Karen. It's very hard to talk to Neil about a lot of things. I mean, Neil was not a communicator. But whether he was struggling or not, why should I not have his support at this particular time? I think it was just a a hurt that you can't explain to anybody. He just dealt with it the way he could. After Muffy's death, Neil went right back to flying as quickly as he could. That was his way of dealing with it. 
During this time, Neil sees a call for a new class of astronauts because President Kennedy had made the lunar landing commitment. So he decided to throw his name into this election. Given everything that had happened, I think he saw this new challenge as something to focus on. So in September of 1962, when NASA was seriously starting to consider how to do the moon landing, he entered the astronaut corps. Armstrong immediately buried himself in his work preparing for the Gemini program, NASA's next step towards reaching the moon. In 1966, Armstrong was chosen as command pilot for the Gemini 8 mission, the first time that NASA astronauts would attempt to connect two spacecrafts in orbit, a difficult and generous maneuver known as rendezvous and docking. In March 1966, Armstrong and his co-pilot David Scott rocketed into orbit and successfully docked with the target spacecraft Argena, but things quickly went awry. A thruster on the Gemini 8 capsule malfunctioned and the two interlocked spacecrafts began to veer off course. To avoid burning up in the Earth's atmosphere, Armstrong detached from the Argena for the release of the Argena's weight sent the Gemini capsule in a, into an uncontrolled spin. T minus 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, we have ignition. There's ignition, and the Atlas rocket showers its pad with a bright burst of flames. It's airborne now, and it's rising into the sky, a beautiful liftoff. It's a smooth flight. Everything is going uh, as it should be. You can now hear the thunder as it sweeps across our NBC observation point. Typical rattlesnakes and alligators out there are pretty good shaking, I would say. It's a smooth flight. She looks good. Seven hours after liftoff and 27 minutes of normal docking, an excessive yaw and roll motion occurred. Where we felt uh, the structural integrity of the combination was in jeopardy. Unable to find an immediate answer, Mr. Armstrong undocked. We uh, reduced the rates to a point where we felt the undocking could safely be performed without uh, a chance of recontact between the vehicles since there was rotation in essentially all directions, we wanted to be assured that we could get far enough around away from the Gina before some recontact between the vehicles was encountered. The roll rate continued to build up, reaching about one revolution per second. Struggling to regain control, Mr. Armstrong was forced to fire the re-entry thrusters and gradually reasserted control over the spacecraft. Neither crewman experienced any loss of orientation. Gemini never approached a critical structural strain.
The Apollo program was born, a colossal undertaking that required cutting-edge technology, unwavering dedication and the collective genius of scientists, engineers and astronauts. It was a race against the time and a race against a formidable adversary, the Soviet space program. The journey reached the zenith with Apollo 11, the mission that would make history. On July 16, 1969, the towering Saturn V rocket roared to life, carrying astronauts Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin and Michael Collins towards the moon. As Apollo 11 descended towards the lunar surface, the world held its breath, witnessing a moment of history as Armstrong and Aldrin set foot on a moon. Overnight, Armstrong became the most famous man alive. Four million spectators lined the streets of New York City to welcome home Armstrong and his fellow Apollo 11 astronauts in a ticket tape parade. But Armstrong wasn't in for the fame and the accolades. She quietly went, went back to a desk job at NASA headquarters in Washington, D.C., then earned a master's degree in aerospace engineering in 1970. Armstrong retired from NASA in 1971 and took a job as an engineering professor at the University of Cincinnati in his home state of, of Ohio. In 2005, Armstrong consented to a rare television interview of 60 minutes in which he was asked directly if he was uncomfortable with the fame of being the first man on the moon. You sometimes seem uncomfortable with your celebrity, that you'd rather not have all of this attention. No, I just don't deserve it. <laughs> but look, how many people have walked on the moon? Twelve? You were the first. You were chosen to do that. That's special. Yeah, I wasn't chosen to be first. I was just chosen to command that flight. Circumstance put me in that particular role. That wasn't planned by anyone. In 2012, Armstrong went in for heart bypass surgery and the 82-year-old astronaut died of complications. Before leaving the moon, where they'd spent more than 21 hours, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin tossed a package out the door of the lunar module, which was still open. Inside was a patch with the names of White, Grissom, and Chaffee the three astronauts killed in the Apollo 1 mission. But the package also contained symbolic objects of a more personal nature that were authorized by NASA. 
We were allowed to carry this PPK, or personal preference kit. It had to be very small, limited in weight. It was vacuum packed. What I had done, and most did, was you canvassed uh, family members, friends, to what you might carry for them. Neil Armstrong's kit, though, wasn't detailed in any mission reports. It may have included a personal item in memory of his daughter Karen, passed away at two and a half years old. Neil had lost a little girl, and he called her Muffy. Well, one of the craters on the moon that he walked over to was, he called it a baby crater, and he named it Muffy's Crater. He also left something of Muffy's on the moon. I know what it is, but I have never shared that with anyone because Neil told me in confidence, and I'll never break that confidence. Very few people know what Neil Armstrong left on the moon for his daughter, Muffy. When he died on August 25th, 2012, at 82 years old, the astronaut took this secret, along with many others, to the grave. Right or wrong, these secrets continue adding to the legend that began almost 45 years earlier in the middle of July. Did that affect your work at that time? Some people, when they're hit with a tragedy like that, they pour themselves into their work. Yeah. It's, it's difficult for me to, to know. Uh, I, uh, I thought the best thing for me to do in that situation was to uh, continue with my work keep things as normal as, as I could and uh, try as I, hard as I could not to, uh, not to have it af affect my ability to do useful things. But that's not an easy thing to do. H how do you think you did? Uh, well, at the time, I, the family was handling it well and I was, uh, I was doing the best I could.